you think you have all sorts of skills to then start a business and the reality is again quite different you know because yes you perhaps have a set of technical skills but the business is completely 360. Business of Architecture UK episode 68. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture UK. I'm your host Ryan Willard and this week I am talking internationally with Salvador Rivas, who is a Mexican architect. He's a RABA chartered architect with an MArch in architectural design from the Bartlett School of Architecture. Yay, my, my old stomping ground. Uh, and for more than 20 years, he's actually collaborated with leading architectural practices in Mexico and the UK. And he was an associate partner at Fosters and Partners, where he worked for more than a decade on various high profile projects around the world. So I met with Salvador. He was in London recently on a trip and he got in contact. He'd been listening to the podcasts. He's um, worked with the Architects Marketing Institute. Um, he set up his practice around about two years ago, 2017. Um, and his own practice is called SARC or Salvador Rivas Architects. And it's actually the first Reba chartered practice in Mexico. And they focus a lot on the development of innovative, sustainable and adaptable projects of various scales and typologies. Um, and he's also a joint professor of sustainable design at the Universidad Iberoamericano in Mexico and has recently founded an R&D company in the UK, which is focused on building innovation and technology. So in this interview, um, Salvador and I discussed the kind of differences between operating in Mexico and in London, the benefits, the pros, the cons, and also just how he's been going around um, and at these kind of early stages of his company, how they've been engaging in business development because they've got some pretty interesting projects where they're doing uh, various things with airport terminals and just kind of infrastructure type of projects, um, how they're collaborating and how they're going about and actually winning these bits of work uh, is really, really fascinating. And Salvador's just got this incredible passion for architecture and wealth of expertise and knowledge, which he's brought from Foster's. And he kind of gives us a bit of a glimpse and an insight into um, the kind of, some of the kind of business practices of Foster's and the types of things that have been brought from those kind of practices uh, and can be implemented and used into smaller practices. So sit back, relax and enjoy Salvador Rivas. So massive thank you to all of you for listening and supporting the Business of Architecture UK for the last couple of years. Big shout out to those of you who have come to our live events, attended the webinars, and of course to those of you who have downloaded the weekly podcast and have been listening to them on your bicycles. And as you know, we love helping architects win meaningful and profitable work, but it's not always that simple to implement these ideas or translate them into something that will work for you. So what I wanted to do was to invite you onto a quick 15 minute chat with myself we can both grab a cup of tea and I'd like to ask you about what content you found most valuable and why and what you'd like to hear more of and I'd also love to hear more about your business and what you're building at the moment and where you are headed to business wise in 2020 so there's no charge or any obligation with this call just simply to find out how our content has been of value and if we get that far and with your permission of course what might be next what might be possible and how Business of Architecture UK could be supportive of that. Does that sound fair? Brilliant. So if you want to book a 15 minute chat with me, I'm calling these calls the BOA UK Discovery Call or just simply a chat with Ryan. Use the link in the information and I look forward to speaking to you. Hey Salvador, welcome to the Business of Architecture UK. Thank you, Ryan. Um, it's great to, to join you today. And thank you very much for inviting me to, to be part of, of this great podcast. My absolute pleasure. So you are actually based out in Mexico City. You've trained in the UK. You were at the Bartlett's for a period of time. And then you also worked for Foster's for the best part of a decade. Is that right? That's, that's correct. Yeah, it's been... It's it's been quite a, a journey in that sense. Uh, I'm originally from Mexico and um, I always wanted to go to the UK for a reason, uh, believe it or not. So I, I don't know why. I, I blame it on James Bond, perhaps. <laughs> uh, but, uh, <laughs> 
but uh, yeah, I, I mean, um, as soon as I decided to, to become an architect, I really set my uh, my goal to join uh, Foster and Partners. Um, I think it's, it's quite a great architectural and even multidisciplinary practice. Um, I uh, basically went to the Bartlett's uh, in a way by chance. And then I soon realized that uh, I was at one of the best schools of architecture in the world. So it's just interesting how, you know, you set you know certain goals, and you know you can you can get some nice um, surprises. So it's been it's been in a way back and forth between the the UK and Mexico in that sense for the last few years. And you actually came back to Mexico City whilst working at Foster's, correct? That's correct. Uh, um, basically, since I joined the practice uh, more than ten years ago. Um, Gradually, we started, or well, Fosters started becoming more interested in opening, you know, new markets in Latin America, and of course, Mexico uh, became quite attractive. So for many years, uh, we were doing, uh, you know, competitions. Uh, we did a great uh, master plan project for the city, um, and then more recently, um, I became involved into a mixed use development in northern Mexico. And basically, the reason that brought me here uh, was the project for the Mexico New International Airport, which uh, unfortunately has been uh, halted by the current government uh, a few months ago. Uh, but then, basically, I was kind of uh, fortunate enough to to have left, uh, you know, and set on my own uh, before that. Um, we we're all still, you know, quite shocked about uh, these decisions, but the mm. project was great, the experience was great. And uh, in a way, the, the opportunities in, in these markets, you know, are a bit like that. It's a bit like the Wild West, uh, you know, you get ups and downs. Um, but but it's, it's in a way quite good to, to be here and, um, and without, being able to to return to Mexico, perhaps I wouldn't have done what I'm doing nowadays. And when you, so you were kind of operating like a, a satellite office for Fosters and you were exploring business development opportunities on that, on, on that side of things. Um, how, how then does, or what was the decision for you then to break away and do your own thing? Cause that's, that's quite a massive, Yes, no, decision. certainly. It was, it was perhaps one of the most uh, difficult decisions I've made. It took me really quite uh, a while, I mean, together with my family to, you know, uh, in a way, follow my dream brackets. Mm. Um, and yeah, I mean, the, the way it was working is that I was traveling back and forth. So based in London, coming to Mexico. And the thing is, when I moved here, um, you know, I, I realized about all those different opportunities and potential that uh, could, uh, could be, you know, explored a bit further. So um, when, when we came uh, together with the team, it was very much to focus on the project more, more than anything. And then from then on, uh, yeah, as part of that business development that we also had to be involved in, um, you know, we, I realized uh, what, what potential, what other opportunities could be, could be explored. And how would you say the the sort of the market opportunities differ from the UK in Mexico? What are the what are the opportunities and what are the obstacles? What are the pros and cons? Well, as you know, with any um, any situation, yeah, definitely you you always have to balance things out. And you know, I, again, I worked in small, medium, and large practices in both countries for well nearly 20 years I've been doing this and I was able to you know notice the differences in a way uh, what the UK provides and became quite attractive to me it's more certainty in terms of you know the way you do business um, the way things are structured you know you have the RIBA um, you know people really value um, architecture and design um, in general terms and, and there is uh, quite um, a good structure uh, for things to, to develop. You know, you get your contracts, you get your fee. But, uh, at, but at the same time, I realized that, of course, the UK is quite a competitive uh, market. Um, there are loads of really good architects. Um, and, and that's, in a way, 
what limits um, certain you know opportunities uh, especially for the sort of projects that you start working in when you when you join a larger practice so the difference in mexico is the other way around of course you have exposure i mean at the moment we're working on projects that i wouldn't have believed that we're working in you know from a 35 story residential tower to a 30,000 square meter uh, airport terminal expansion wow. to an 8 kilometer urban linear park and that's again all thanks to the wow. previous experience uh, yeah know, mainly at fosters so yes uh, that that's the bright side but the downside is exactly the opposite to what i mentioned <laughs> in terms of, of the uk there is more uncertainty i mean there is there is also um you know uh, 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 an institution um, that brings architects together but yeah. it just works different um things are more more informal um it has taken some time uh, for um, clients to value the role of architects um, overall. There are really good architects in the country, and that's you know quite quite good uh, because it it brings up the level uh, in terms of the whole. <laughs> you know, it's one thing for another uh, in, in those terms. So. So that, that's amazing. So you've got some really quite incredible projects for a young practice working on infrastructure and in that kind of large scale work. How did you win those early projects? That, uh, that has also been the challenging part because of course, you know, uh, I got asked so many times, you know, have you thought about starting on your own? And perhaps after the 10th time that I replied, well, that's a dream, that's a dream, I thought, well, when would I be able to, you know, pursue uh, that dream? Um, and people tell you, oh, well, with your credentials, you know, you would be able to, to work on great projects and so on. The reality is different. Um, it has been challenging, uh, to be mm -hmm. honest, to get these projects. Uh, it has, uh, you know, basically to, it has to do with, um, the relationships you build up uh, during time. Um, and again, that was the thing. I was based in the UK, but mainly working in Mexico. So I got mm -hmm. to know, you know, good uh, colleagues and friends. So most uh, of these commissions, we basically they are invitations for us to collaborate with other architects. Um, and in a way, focus on a designer role which is which is good for us because yeah. then we can split up uh, you know the work quite nicely and not to have the typical conflicts in terms of who's doing what <laughs> and who's the designer of the project and so on and also in a way we you know it has been more than anything two ways um, we have been acting as um, the executive architects uh, again for projects from Foster and Partners and from Swedish architects and now Spanish architects. So that, that's something that wasn't perhaps considered at first, but we're becoming or we're playing that role. And, and the other aspect is, in a way, we're doing some sort of consultancy. Uh, I mean, because of the previous experience I had on large uh, projects and complex projects, these clients are inviting us to to basically provide them some uh, advice and support uh, on how to to develop uh, the project into executive level in Mexico. So it, it's been, you know, again, challenging, but at the same time, surprising how things can, in a way, evolve to what you considered uh, at first for things to be. And, and how big's the team at the moment? Um, at the moment, we are six uh, team members. We have four architects. We have one intern and one um, administrative uh, communication uh, member of staff. Um, growth has been, you know, one of the things that, of course, is always challenging to deal with. Yeah. Because, again, coming from, you know, a huge practice, you know, when I left Foster's, we were 1,400 staff. Wow. Um, you have it all <laughs> in a way yeah. you, you truly have it all. You know, you have access 
to all areas, uh, to all resources. So then becoming, you know, this one man band from one day to another, uh, it's quite something. I, um, I, of course, you know, had a whole year to start preparing myself mentally and even emotionally that that would yeah. happen. Um, so the first three months were really difficult. You know, I was working, you know, 18 hours every day, weekdays, weekends, started to draw again, you know, all sorts of things. Uh, and after those three months, I, I just realized that I, I, I needed help. So um, again, it, it's, been, it's been challenging because uh, once you start, uh, you know, getting uh, more team members, then you start getting more responsibilities and more commitments and so on. So if it's not handled carefully, it can backfire. Uh, and I learned that, you know, quite soon. Last year, we went up to eight members of staff just because some larger projects were coming along and they never came. Uh, and then we were left you know, with a large team. So, uh, gosh, yeah, it's always, you know, uh, juggling all these, all these things at the, at the same time. And, and but growth, how, uh, sorry, but growth, growth is important. I mean, if anything I've learned um, during these months, and again, thanks to AMI and other programs, is that a company is destined to grow. To grow. Um, because otherwise you are not able to, to handle, you know, the work that you, you would like to handle eventually. Mm. So let's, let's just quickly talk, you just mentioned the AMI. So for, for those listeners who don't know what AMI is, what is, what is that and how did you get involved and how has it supported your business? Yeah, um, in that sense, I think, you know, what is really important is that once you start uh, your business, um, as I read somewhere, as a glorified technician, you know, <laughs> you live, you live, uh, you know, your stable uh, job and then you think you have all sorts of skills to then start a business and the reality is again quite different you know because yes you perhaps perhaps have a set of technical skills but the business is completely 360. Um, there are things that I have learned in the past couple of years that I had no idea <laughs> about uh, of course um, but what is important is once you start doing this and um, things start not going as planned, which was the case last year because of the political situation. Right. Um, Mexico at the moment is going through a very uh, challenging period. Uh, you know, it cannot be quite compared to, to the Brexit in the UK, but we're, we're also dealing with, with our issues here. So quite early on, really, within the one year, uh, and with eight members of staff, I realized that, oh, wow, I cannot de- do this on my own. So I started looking for help. I went into, you know, webinars, seminars, and um, started getting into business coaching. And I I found out about the Architects Marketing Institute. And I joined straight away, unusually. Uh, You know, I went into Facebook and I signed up and I took the first webinar. And I say unusually because it's not (laughs) something I would do, you know, kind of uh, just going straight into into social media and um and i realized you know about the enormous potential the really good structure um the resources that uh, they have available and both richard and enoch um you know are great it's a good balance act Uh, richard is a marketing expert Uh, enoch is an architect so between both of them you know they they really encourage architects to in a way, regain, you know, their uh, dreams and their goals and so on. So, again, I think I was quite fortunate because from what I hear, you know, a lot of people joining these programs are, is when things are already quite bad after quite some time. Yeah. yeah. And, and it's, it's interesting that you say that. I mean, I always say to people that when to, to start learning about business and entrepreneurship and sales and marketing most people only ever start to invest in themselves like that when shit's hit the fan basically completely and and there's a panic and actually that's the worst time to do it because these things take time to learn there's it's hard graft it's work you've got to put in the energy any system any marketing system takes time to be tested to implement for you to get it to work right 
Um, and so, you know, if you're desperate for cash right now, it's, it's kind of like, I mean, that's symptomatic of lots of other things that are going on, but um, being able to have a little bit of breathing space and educate yourself in business makes a world of difference. So, so what was it? What were the key things that you, that really started to sh change and shape your thinking about architecture and architecture as a business? Um, I think overall, it, it's a long process. I mean, uh, you know, architecture is one of those areas that, you know, we architects tend to be quite perfectionists about everything we do and how things have to turn out. And, and we see life as another project and we expect, you know, <laughs> that you would have your, in a way, concept scheme and detail design uh, sort of development. Uh, and again, you, you have to remain quite flexible and quite adaptable. And, and you know, I'm now confidently saying this, but but it's been a learning process, you know. I've had to to deal with my my own issues, um, and again, it's when Ami. One one of the nice things about that is is about um, kind of reassessing your commitment to what you're doing, and and that's so important, you know, from the from the start, is how much you want things to. To happen you know mm -hmm. and then from then on uh, the second most important thing but perhaps even the most important is the mindset um, you know once once I went through the mindset uh, sessions uh, that was quite a revelation because I I think you know it's it's down to ourselves um, to to grow as uh, you know persons and as professionals and once you start surrounding yourself with people that think alike, which was my case at, at Foster's, you know, I always felt quite encouraged and motivated and it was always, always a learning uh, process. Um, so without having that, I, I just needed to, to look for something else uh, in a way. Um, so uh, it's true. You really need to, first of all, stop at some point and even if it's not you, maybe the situation <laughs> would uh, force you to do that and, and just reassess. Uh, the, way, the way I saw it, and I was thinking about a lot of things myself, you know, it's, it's, there must be a way to do things differently. There must be a way, you know, to, to be able to become successful, of course, through hard work, but, but it's the investment that you mentioned. I mean, you mm. really need to um, be aware uh, or become aware that you really need to invest time, money, and effort to be able to achieve those goals. I mean, things don't happen, you know, for free, <laughs> um, yeah. you know, from one day to another, certainly. Yeah, no, exactly. It's, it's kind of an illusion of, you know, rapid, spontaneous growth in, in a business without the kind of the grind or the expertise or the systems that are in place. And, it, it's just something to kind of reframe and be very, very aware of. Um, so I'm, I'm, re I'm really interested because it's Foster's and Rogers in the UK have been responsible for laying the DNA of so many different architectural practices. And I would say a, a huge amount of people that I speak to on the podcast have had some stint at one of these two practices at some time or, or if not are working with somebody who has. So what was it? And, and Foster's is obviously, you know, the, probably the largest practice in the UK. Um, and what would you say are the, are the business expertise and tools that you saw at Foster's that you've, interpreted or borrowed and picked up and implemented into your own practice? Yeah. Um, and, and you're right. I mean, basically again, from years ago, I, I really became quite, quite interested. Um, not only in, in those two practices, I think overall the UK, um, in terms of architecture and design and the example is that perhaps, you know, out of the, 10 most respected uh, architects and designers in the world are, are based in the UK or come from the UK. So there is, there is definitely something uh, in that sense. Uh, I also think that it has to do with education. 
and even in a way, you know, in terms of the British mentality <laughs> um, <laughs> on how to do things, uh, you know, uh, it's interesting. It, it's it's about challenging conventions. It's about questioning. It's about creativity. And in a way, about eccentricity. So all these things combined, uh, you know, result in, in great, in great formulas. I like um, that. <laughs> <laughs> and, and and I also saw that, you know, at at the Bartlett's. Um, I was I was fortunate enough to study um, under Peter Cook's guidance, and and he mentioned a lot of of these things as well. You know, it, it's just how how Britain um, you know brings all these things together in, in quite a, a nice way. Um, but in terms of of the practice itself, um, I think first of all, Foster's has Norman Foster as um, <laughs> obvious as it would seem. Um, mm -hmm. He is, uh, I believe, you know, quite a great architect in many ways, not only as a designer, but also, um, you know, as a salesperson, um, as a leader, as a motivator, and so on, you know. Um, I, was, I was fortunate enough to, to have worked in a few projects where uh, he was quite directly involved. And, and, it, and it's that, you know, it, it's just the drive, it's the pursuit of excellence, it's uh, taking care of your clients, um, it's building up a world-class team, um, and it's just really thinking about the future. I think Foster's goal, in a way, is really to, to change the world, you know, in in a in a quite positive way, you know, mm -hmm. uh, sustainability has been there since the '60s. Technology, innovation, and so on, and that's why you know people, uh, team members are there for years and years because again, your exposure to all that is just uh, fantastic. And, and again, in a way, it's I, I started teaching recently <laughs> here in Mexico as well. And when people ask me, when my students ask me, you know, how, how was it being at Foster? So it's like, you know, in a way, it's like being back at university, of course, with different responsibilities. Um, but but it, it feels like that. It's like a campus, you know, uh, and you, you get to know and get to talk and get to learn from brilliant people from all over the world. And, and it was the same in other practices, I, I have to say, you know. So I, I think perhaps that's, those are the key elements that one can you know, learn from, from such practices. It, it, interesting. You mentioned that you mentioned Foster was a great salesperson, a great architect and a great leader. Um, what do you mean by uh, salesperson? Um, I was, I was able to, to be, uh, at one of, um, uh, of his presentations, you know, uh, in person to, to one of, uh, of our potential clients. And I was just amazed. I was amazed about the way he was able just to convey all the information that the team had provided him before and how he was able just to bring all that message to the client in a very clear and direct manner. Um, and again, that, that's really a skill that, you know, as architects, we really need to, to develop. Uh, again, I don't think anyone is born, <laughs> you know, with that. Uh, and, and, and we see that not only, you know, in architects. Uh, any, any person who is achieving anything in this world has to perhaps sell the project to themselves <laughs> mm. and then to his team and his family or her family and other people and so on. So we're, we don't realize, but we have to be constantly selling um, you know, what we are and what we do. Because otherwise, you know, how can we make uh, things happen? So, so in a way, I, I, and I've seen that, you know, with, uh, with Lord Foster, you know, different presentations, uh, how, again, he was just able to, to bring all that information and, um, and play back the message to the client and, really sophisticated clients of course you know we're talking about you know ron dennis or at the time steve jobs michael bloomberg you know i mean wow how can you <laughs> get to to you know 
extremely sophisticated clients like that, you know, with a very clear message. Uh, and of course, with the support of, of a great team, you know, uh, you, you, you can stand in front of people and, you know, say, we can do this for you, knowing that you can do that. Um, and I think, again, that's, that's part of, of, uh, of what, is, what is really great about him and, and his practice. Amazing. I mean, yeah, it's fascinating that you say that, obviously, because he's, you know, Fosters is dealing with these huge titans of industries, you know, absolute game changers, disruptors, world leaders. Um, it's, it's a very powerful form of communication that he's extremely masterful at, uh, is, is communicating the clarity of his architectural ideas and being able yes. to enroll others and communities into, into the, into those. So how do you, how do you market yourself? How do you go about selling your practice now? Um, I mean, again, it's been a learning curve. Uh, the way we started is as any other architects would do. Uh, and I read once that basically we're just, uh, you know, uh, advertising our portfolio. And it seems that we are <laughs> producing material for other architects and just to say, you know, this is what we're doing. Uh, and we very much started like that, you know, quite conventional social media, publishing our experience, our projects, uh, any competition that we would do. But again, um, after after joining uh, Ami's program, uh, we noticed, of course, that the important thing was to be able to produce content, rather than saying, you know, oh, look uh, how good we are. Is hello, how can we help you? You know, uh, and that's been a turning point for us um, completely. And and it's been it's been also challenging because you know uh, Ami's uh, resources, uh, which I truly believe are are great and are right uh, because in a way um, previous to, to joining the program I have been reading and listening to you know different people and so on and in a way what Ami uh, has done is to to condense and bring all that information together and most importantly focused uh, for architects and architecture um, so so the way we're doing it now it, it's very much through social media you know our key platforms uh, we issue a printed uh, newsletter and a digital newsletter we have uh, prepared material like a project planning pack and a guide for project development for our clients um, and so on so, um, so the, the, the newsletters and the project planning pack, what, what's involved in those? How do they work as a strategy? Uh, so basically because we, we noticed that the, any electronic newsletter, I mean, generally tends to go to spam or, you know, it's actually not many people are reading them. Um, the, the advice was really to go back in a way to a more personal uh, approach and, and, you know, just handling these, um, these printed newsletters. Um, so we, we include content, relevant news. We include, of course, all other resources. And, and with the project planning pack, I was actually quite surprised about how, in a way, quite uh, logical and what we would think standard you know, content would be so useful for clients. And again, I think that's one of the challenges for architects. We, we, we are hearing and, and seeing ourselves all the time, but we don't, we don't hear and we don't see our clients. We, we don't basically get into their shoes in mm. terms of what information they need, what help they need. And most importantly, how we can effectively communicate that. We, we keep talking an architectural language. Uh, and again, you know, it's like architects talking to architects. Uh, uh, and again, it, it needs to be a different way. Every client is different. Uh, what we've also noticed is that our clients actually are also quite sophisticated. So we cannot go there and say things that they already know. And, and we're very much working on that. I mean, as you said at first, it's a learning process and it's about testing what, what works well. Um, at the end, in our culture in Mexico, it's, it's a person to person. It's a personal introduction, introduction. It's a personal recommendation. It doesn't matter if you send your amazing CV or portfolio. If you're not 
introduced personally, it's very difficult to, to right. get any sort of commission. Got it. And since you've made the, the transition from working at Foster's to doing your own company, how have you found your responsibilities have altered and shifted? Oh, wow. Um, I, w- I would say massively. <laughs> I mean, um, when, I, when I left Foster's, uh, I, I was at the position of associate partner and I was uh, based here in Mexico, you know, with, again, a lot of, let's say, technical uh, logistics and part of business development side of things. Also administration, because um, I, I had to help for the, for the office to, to be set up here. And again, my take uh, on things generally has been like, it's not that I, I don't want to do things or I don't like doing things. I, I just do them, you know? And, mm. and in a way, <laughs> um, that helps. That really helps because you, you can go back to those things. And even if it's not your area of expertise or interest, you can really go back and say, oh, actually, I've done that. Or I, I saw how that's done. So what I'm trying to say is that uh, it, was, it was quite a massive shift. Of course, coming from this uh, great... Uh, support you know that you just lifted the phone or sent an email and things were resolved to do it all yourself and and i had to in a way calm down (laughs) because of course as you can imagine i wanted things uh, to be you know perfect from from day one yeah Um, and and i've worked myself quite quite hard for that to happen in terms of implementing systems or developing procedures and and we're we're expanding that to the team now which is also quite good Um, but it takes time it really takes time and it's all about again just say i cannot do this Uh, i need help and be able uh, to delegate which is again something that architects were you know it's just to say i i cannot do it all um, we need to split the, the responsibility uh, with the team. Actually, that that's something that we're doing uh, quite a lot, uh, and it's getting a lot of responsibility quite soon and early on. And you know, again, giving the confidence uh, that as architects you can take on uh, bigger challenges that you ever thought you would be able to to achieve. And so when you're, when you're growing the team and this is, you know, something I'm going through at the moment in my own practice, um, you know, you start winning larger bits of work. There's a bit more money coming into stuff and you realize, as you say, that you can't do everything. And as an architect, mm-hmm. we're, we can't, we're kind of reluctant to let go. How do you know yes. who to employ first and what's the, and what's the process? And I'm kind of asking that selfishly. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah no i mean it's uh, you know when when i was considering starting my own practice um i i met with a lot of colleagues and friends here in mexico and i started asking you know you know how are things what are the biggest challenges for you and so on and i probably met 20 people and all of them told me that the most difficult thing was to um, get a good team. I mean, it was the recurrent answer. You know, they all told me it's very difficult to get the right people. It's very difficult to build up the team. And, and I took notes. Um, so it is, it is challenging, of course, because, you know, it's difficult to, to get to know a person, you know, uh, within a few minutes and then, um, you know, build up a relationship. We've been fortunate because um, our first team member actually came to me uh, and said, I want to work with you. Uh, And then from then on, he invited another colleague and another colleague. And and that's how we organically grew. Uh, From then on, um, also uh, former students of um, of me have, uh, have been joining the practice. And, uh, and so on. But it's, it's definitely challenging. Um, but at the same time, I have noticed and I became to realize that companies also play a massive role 
you know, when you, when you invite someone to join your team, it's also your responsibility to be able to, you know, uh, bring that person on board, align your objectives, um, you know, what's the company's culture, uh, mm. what are the expectations and so on, and what is the room for growth? Uh, and then I realize now that basically uh, that was the issue <laughs> when I was talking to my friends. Um, none of that generally happens you know we we don't generally invite people to come on board and grow together with us you know it's, uh, we, we need to stop seeing our team members as employees and even ourselves as mm. you know business owners and company directors or whatever the title would be uh, we're just another you know uh, important part of of the company that's really, really interesting. You know, there is a, you know, I mean, I've experienced it when working, when, and I know a lot of architects that I speak to, when they feel like it's just a role or they're being, you know, you're just trying to execute something and it's not being part of a team, not being part of a culture, not sharing a vision or a mission that it, you know, when you don't do that, it creates a very, it just creates a very different form of employment, which is perhaps not as productive and not as enriching and fulfilling as doing what you're saying. Yes. Yeah. And it has to do a lot with the culture as well. I mean, the way we're used here is very much that, you know, you're an employee and you have a boss and it's all, you know, uh, quite hierarchical, which I, I I, I saw that so many times because I also worked in Mexico previously, but it, it even got to the point that I, in a way, that's why I, I jumped ships, you know, because yeah. I, I, I actually thought I cannot work for somebody else uh, here the way things are generally done. I just can't, you know, because my experience in the UK was completely different. You know, you have, mm going back to the certainty, going back to the CPDs, you know, personal development, um, you know, there, it's just a different approach that has to be, uh, you know, encouraged further. I think as business owners, uh, we really need to, again, stop for a moment and, and really think what we want out of our companies, um, and then from then on, if that can permeate into the rest of the team members, then I think things are, are possible. So in that sense, very few people have uh, left, uh, you know, our team. Uh, and, and it's perhaps thanks to, to that. So, so, so does have you, your sort of UK experience, does that really set you apart in Mexico? Makes you quite um, unique or is that... I done the same I would <laughs> I would like to think uh, it is and I I I have to be honest I perhaps haven't um you know spread the message that much uh, again going back to the mindset and that you don't want to advertise yourself too much you don't want to be seen like the smart kid you know uh, <laughs> kind of oh here comes this guy yeah 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 he comes from britain and i've had all sorts of comments about that but uh, but I would say yes, yes, because it was 15 years uh, of my personal and professional life there. Actually, mm. you know, it, London is a place where I've lived the most throughout my life. Right. And it basically shaped my personal and professional life, I, I could say now. I very much consider myself, in a way, like, a British architect in Mexico or a Mexican architect in Britain. You know, it's, it's very much both worlds um, together. Uh, but yes, I mean, um, and all those years at Foster's, you know, it's, it's, it was really 12 years and I, I got to take on important responsibilities and roles and um, I got to learn and hear from my uh, directors and colleagues and so on. So, um, I, I would think yes, and and we uh, I, perhaps the thing that would set us apart is just how we deal with things. Uh, at the moment, we're very much heading into a recession, from what I hear <laughs> in the news. Um, 
and we are we're working harder than, than ever you know we're, we're mm. not contracting ourselves we keep spending and investing and as difficult as it is every time i just have the strong belief that is the only way we will be able to to create that uniqueness um the great news is that um well, after I met you in London, we, yep. we basically set up a company there. Um, that's why <laughs> I said it was quite a productive trip um, because we want to pursue a design research and development uh, based there. And we have just got uh, the membership for RIBA Chartered Practice. And we are the first one uh, in Mexico to, to do that. Oh, congratulations. So, thank you. <laughs> thank you. We, it's hard work. I mean, I'm, I'm exhausted. What can I say? But, but uh, once you see things happening, I mean, the satisfaction is just enormous. I mean, Amazing. it's just like, wow. And, so, and again, so, I mean, it's, so, so tell me a little bit, but what, what is the, the design research arm that's based here then? What's that? Um, it's basically something, um, and again, thanks to thanks to the change in mindset. More than more than the change is is kind of um, um, uh, in a way a re encounter, if I could say that, with with your mindset. Because perhaps the mindset was there. It's just that once you are an employee for such a long time, you forget about certain things. To be honest, and. Yeah. Um, so it's funny, uh, and I'm going to say this quite honestly. Um, I had an eye surgery back in May, and I was lying in bed for two weeks uh, without being able to see much. So I was only relying on audio. So I started uh, listening to audiobooks, and I started listening to your podcast. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and I'm saying this really, I mean, honestly, I, I really um, became quite inspired about all the things that I, uh, I heard, you know, from other colleagues and from other, you know, professions and other experts and so on. So I, you know, once I came back to the office, I just told the team, you know, we need to do this. Uh, it's basically a project that I've been thinking of for 20 years since I was at the Bartlett's. It's about um, adaptable uh, projects and, and architecture. Um, yeah. and, and it's been my passion, you know, my hidden passion in a way for many years. Um, so now it's the time to do it in a way, you know, uh, and just go for it. And, and, and it's just amazing going back to the goal setting thing. You know, I, I started writing down in a way that I would open an office in the UK at some point. Even my business cards have <laughs> an address printed there. Um, and now it's, it's a reality. It's just amazing how the power of will and, of course, commitment and perseverance and patience can, can really pay off. Um, so that's what we're trying to do. It's very early on. Uh, I'm trying to, I'm trying to build up the business here, <laughs> which is yeah. already quite challenging, and building the business there. So, uh, but again, it, it's bit by bit. But you really need to, to get going. I, I think that's that's the thing I would say. Amazing. No, that's that's really exciting news and. Uh, very, very, yeah, it's fantastic. Great stuff. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, it, it's interesting because as a young architect, I remember somebody saying to us, maybe it was a tutor, maybe it was uh, somebody I was working for, maybe it was somebody when I was working at Rogers, uh, and they were talking about, have you ever considered, rather than setting up practice in the UK, that you go abroad and set up a practice there because there are other countries and Mexico is often mentioned as one of them. Vietnam is another one, other parts of Central America, um, parts of Africa, places like Kenya. These are all emerging, some of them more developed than others, uh, but there is something about these nations that has emerging innovations, emerging economies that are happening. There's huge growth. There are needs that need to be answered. And they're not kind of filled with the, you know, well, one, the, the sort of the tight 
planning constrictions and the other sort of financial constraints that it takes in the UK, for example, just to get anything done. Is that something that you would, you would agree upon and is, is the future bright for Mexico and should we all be looking to, to go there? Um, I would say yes, uh, overall. Um, and again, I really had enough time perhaps 10 years <laughs> to, mm. to be able to assess those opportunities. I mean, when I left in the year 2000, uh, I had already worked here in, with a, an architect I, I respect hugely and great projects. And, and, but then I decided to, to go to the UK and I decided to stay in the UK, um, which, mm. which in a way says a lot, um, you know, in terms of the structure that it provides, it comes with its limitations. It's true, you know, in terms of you know planning, permission, and all the things that you have to go through, and uh, and so on. Um, but I I remember, you know, when we started working uh, on the, on the airport project, and and I don't know if you or the audience would know it quite well. But I, I would suggest just to go into the Foster and Partners <laughs> website uh, because perhaps it was, and I'm sorry to talk about it in past tense, uh, one of, of the most important projects uh, in recent times in many ways. Wow. Um, and now it's being cancelled, you know, by, there, there are still no um, strong arguments or fundamental reasons for, for that to have happened. Uh, we're still struggling <laughs> to, to come to terms with it. I mean, I spent four years of my life working on that project and most of my colleagues even five or six years. So what I'm trying to say is that yes, there are opportunities. Yes, uh, it's emerging economies. Yes, there's innovation. But at the same time, uh, we have to balance uh, risks. Um, it's like the Wild West, as I said, uh, you know, it's, you get huge opportunities like the projects we're working on now. I mean, in, in, in the UK, I'm, I know, and I, I, I know my colleagues and I, even former directors from larger practices, the sort of project that you start doing uh, once you start. And it's a very kind of long-term process. <laughs> so here you can speed up things in a way you know, within few months, years, you can build up a great portfolio and you can actually build buildings and so on. But, but it comes with risks. Um, and, you know, and, and it's not only the airport, uh, other projects getting canceled. At the moment, the Mexico City uh, government has halted around 60 to 80 projects uh, going on just because they want to review all the planning permits and so on. Right. And people are like, what? <laughs> so uh, I think, you know, and once, and I'm sorry, I keep repeating that myself, but it's the best reference I can get. Um, Norman gave a talk at the um, RIBA um, and I asked that question, you know, it's what would be your advice for younger architects? It's a question that I just wanted to make for time and time again and I just didn't have the chance so I asked um, you know him and in front of the audience and so on and and his advice at the time was that you know it's just like oh, you, architects young architects have to open up to new opportunities even if that means new places new experiences and so on and and that really got stuck in, in my mind mm -hmm. so what I'm trying to say is that yes uh, we we should you know, attempt things in other countries and other places. But at the same time, and that's, that's the thing for me at the moment, it's like I'm, I'm here, but I also feel that I need to be in the UK, you know, to, yeah. to balance things out um, and also diversify. Uh, I don't think we, we can keep doing the same thing uh, that we've been doing as architects. We need to keep reinventing ourselves um, and adapt just to the, current situation which seems to be quite crazy everywhere <laughs> um so so yeah i think again with opportunities it's just we, we need to to be ready to to be able to deal with with these huge risks fabulous 
Salvador, thank you so much. Massively inspirational speaking with you. Um, and best of luck for the next few years of growth in your company. Thank you very much, Rian. I mean, it's been great, um, you know, again, being able to talking to you after meeting you in London again, something that, you know, I would have never <laughs> expected it would happen. And, um, and perhaps if I may, um, of course, just um, the, the advice, the humble advice I would give to anyone uh, planning to start their own business or setting their own practice is, you know, just, there's a lot of talk, of talk about, you know, follow your dreams and, you know, passion comes first and money after and so on. Um, it, it, it needs preparation. It really needs planning. It really needs, yes, you can follow, you know, your gut feeling and your passion and so on. But, but one, and I, I think perhaps that's something I wish someone would have told me before. It's like, yes, great, you're thinking about this. But here are the steps, at least the basic steps that you need to take um, to not um, die <laughs> early on, you know, um, yeah. b because it's a massive take. It's a massive take to, you have a lot of responsibility, a lot of pressure, a lot of things. And it's just very, very different to, to having a permanent job in a way. So uh, that, that's perhaps the, the one thing is just get as much information, seek help, you know, uh, as soon as you need it. Um, and, and yeah, of course, follow your passion and get surrounded yourself by people that think like you and, and just, yeah, work, work hard. I mean, it may sound obvious, but just working hard can pay off as long as there is a, the, the goal is there and there is proper proper structure but yeah it, it's it's fascinating it's uh, encouraging um, it's it's great this experience but i think everyone should be aware that it's also for the long run and yes. it's, it just really takes time and and energy and effort but if if anyone is ready to do it just go for it amazing Brilliant. Wise words. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. Well, thank you, Rian. And it's been, again, great talking to you. Thank you again for the invitation. And, and um, I hope this helps uh, other colleagues, friends, and architects out there to, well, just um, rethink uh, the way we, we're approaching uh, our business nowadays. Wonderful. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. And that's a wrap. Thank you so much for listening. And don't forget to book your 15-minute chat with me by using the link in the information. I look forward to speaking with you. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond, or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.